You know how the Bible says in the book of Acts, when they cried out for boldness, the place that they prayed was shaken? Yeah. It doesn't say the walls. We say walls. But the scripture says the place was shaken. Even the air reacts right. to the presence of Jesus. Genesis 26, 18 tells us, Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. Listen, I am excited about today because we're going to dig into some stuff that you may have heard about and you may not have heard about. My guest today is none other than Michael Koulianos. Michael, thank you, Gene. Thanks for thanks being for on today, me. man. I just, I just want to hear what God's got in your heart today. But I want people to know first your story. So tell you know those of you who don't know. I used to work with Pastor Benny Hinn for many years and uh, travel the world with him. And there's a connection that we have with yeah, Pastor Benny. And I want you to tell your story. So go ahead. Sure. Well, uh, thank you for having me. What Absolutely, a joy to be here man. with you. And here at KCM, it's just, it's a joy. And I, I really believe the Lord's knitting all of our hearts together. I agree. Amen. For a massive end time harvest. Right. Yeah. So uh, in 1984, my cousin had just died from cancer. Mm -hmm. And I grew up Greek Orthodox incredibly, incredibly orthodox. Uh, my cousins were archbishops. One was archbishop of North and South America, the other archbishop of Hong Kong and Asia. Wow. I grew up as an altar boy. My cousins were priests. So I had bishops, priests, I mean, you name it, choir singers. We were really in the church and, and I, love, I love the tradition. They're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. And it really impacted my life and still does today. So in 84, my cousin died, my uncle of mm -hmm. cancer. And in our culture, you have memorials or, uh, you know, like, like you go from home to home and eat and kind of mm -hmm. celebrate the memory of the person who died. Well, when at one of those meetings at the home, it was super packed. We had a big family. The women were in re or in, dressed in black. And you, you, we were just hanging out, talking about the life and mourning. And a man walked in the room through the front door. And when he walked in, it was like the only way my seven-year-old little heart could process it because I was sitting there on the floor, I processed it this way. I said, man, Jesus just walked into this room. Wow. His face had a, had a brokenness to it, but a focus also at the same time because Jesus is lion and lamb all at once, you know? Right. And his eyes were like beaming with the compassion and the fierceness of the Lord. And he sat down in the chair. He was a Greek Orthodox priest who had been recently baptized in the Holy Spirit. We didn't know what that meant. Yeah. And he had been baptized in the Spirit in the Pittsburgh area, right where the outpouring was going on with Miss Kuhlman during the charismatic yeah. renewal. Right. And so he came in and just kind of looked everywhere. Now, I was used to priests consoling you, just telling you it's going to be okay, which is all valuable, but he was different. And he looked across the living room at my dad and out of nowhere asked my dad, who had been uh, stricken with this disease uh, called Mycobacteria marinum. He was in a wheelchair or on crutches for about five years. Mm. And he had had five knee surgeries too in that year. And he had actually just come out of that surgery about two days prior and still had the staples in the incision. But the crutches that my dad had been using were behind the couch that he was sitting on, totally out of sight, and my dad had long pants on. So the priest sits down and looks my dad in the eye, which is against, you know, memorial protocol. He says, uh, have you ever seen Jesus? And my dad said, no. Hmm. He said, why not? And I mean, nobody talked to my dad like that. Yeah. My dad was in the military, trained officers for Vietnam, drove around with a 45 caliber on the dashboard. He was just a hard-nosed Greek, old-fashioned yeah. guy. Yeah. He used to fight people for fun. His brother would give him a dollar just to fight his friends, and my dad would do it. Yeah. 
I thought, oh, this priest is in trouble. What a, you don't talk Now about. you're seven. Oh, I'm seven going, seven, this priest yeah. is done. Gotcha. Bad move. My dad said, I don't know why I haven't seen Jesus. And the priest said, do you want to? Now you gotta remember, everyone's in black mourning. Right. Well, right around that time, people start falling on the floor. I had never seen anything like it. We had never seen it. We didn't watch Christian TV. In fact, if we did, we were following the devil, to be honest with you. Sure, sure. But I remember some of the women hitting the ground under the power of God, sobbing, screaming. And then the priest, uh, after he said, do you want to, I thought, I thought Jesus was gonna like teleport like Star Trek or something. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know what he was talking about. Uh, yeah, I just thought this sure, is gonna be really sure. cool. He made a beeline for my dad, went straight for the knee that was covered up, had no way of knowing that that knee was the diseased knee and grabbed it and squeezed it with the staples in it. Wow. And my dad winced with pain. And he said something that I think really framed my life. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. When he said it, the, the, the air changed in the place. The atmosphere changed. It was, you know how the Bible says in the book of Acts, when they cried out for boldness, the place that they pray, pr prayed was shaken. Yeah. It doesn't say the walls. We say walls. But the scripture says the place was shaken. Even the air reacts right. to the presence of Jesus. We've all been in meetings like that where there's such glory, you feel it yeah. in the air. And that's what happened. He grabbed my dad's knee, said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he was real clear, Gene, about the Jesus he was talking about. It had to be the Jesus of the Bible. Right. The real one, not the one we make up. Sure. You know, the Israelites made a golden calf and named it Jehovah. Yeah. I mean, you can create your own Jesus. Yeah. So he said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. So my dad, he said, after the pain, he felt fire shoot up his leg. So he reached behind the couch to grab the, these crutches and he picks up the crutches and he says, the priest says, no, no crutches. You walk in Jesus' name. So my dad takes a step and then another step and another step and he starts sobbing. And I never saw my dad cry outside of his mama's funeral at the casket. But now tears were running down his eyes. Wow. He went back to the doctor the next day and leg pressed more with the leg that had staples in it than the good leg. His leg had, had suffered such atrophy that it was, it was uh, about the size of my arm right. after five years of not sure, using it. Sure, sure. What did this do to your dad? What was he thinking? He just, he didn't know how to explain it. So I went to the doctor, the doctor, oh, he took me to the doctor, which was all the plan of God. I mean, right. God had made sure that I saw all this. And the, the doctor said, what, what's going on? He goes, doc, I don't know. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. And so nobody shared the gospel with my dad. In 1989, Five years later, I got micro, or actually right around 1990, I got micro, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Epstein-Barr's disease. Right. Which is like advanced mono that they say never leaves your system. And there was, I was in bed for just about a year. I'm, I'm uh, withered away. I've lost weight. My parents had to take me out of school. I was homeschooled. And we heard about a preacher in Orlando who was right. also raised Greek Orthodox named Benny Hinn. My cousin, you, I don't know if you might have met him actually, Gene. His name was Father Sam Calamaris. He was an Orthodox mm -hmm. priest. He had just come back from my father-in-law's meeting and my father-in-law prayed for him and he went flying across the platform like he got shot right? and came back with a healing ministry. So I was an altar boy in his church. He came back and held up the communion elements and a blind guy's eyes opened. Oh, wow. So we're like, what's happened to our uncle? Talking about rocking your church. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was dead as a doornail, yeah. just being real with you. Now he comes back, I'm thinking, what's going on? So Father Sam says, we're gonna take Michael there. They read Good Morning Holy Spirit. But my dad's like, you're not taking my son there. Even though my dad had been healed, to leave the church in any way was yeah. horrible. So my mom basically told my dad, she says, look, uh, have I ever not taken care of you? He said, no. She said, do you have three meals a day on the table? He said, yeah. You have clean clothes? Mm. He said, yeah. She said, I'll do anything for you, but you can't keep me from Jesus. I'm taking him. So they took me. I mean, I feel it now. I, I, I pulled onto that property. And the minute I crossed Forest City Road and got onto that mm. property, it was like I stepped into another world. It was instantly took me back to what I felt in that living room with that priest. 
right? It's the same Jesus, same sense of his presence. And my legs start shaking. I got in line and there were people lined up to get into Sunday morning church. I remember. And I thought to myself, man, we lined up to get out of church. Yeah. <laughs> what are these people doing? Yeah. But they were all so happy. And they were singing songs, some of those old like integrity songs. You know? Yeah. And uh, there was a man at the door named Jimmy. It was a Jamaican usher, uh. shaved head and a big old smile on his face. And he was waiting and we were lined up for hours. And when he came out to open the door, you would have thought a stampede was let loose. And he opened that door. And all I knew was this, Gene. I said, this, I love this presence. And it's increasing. It's getting stronger and stronger. When, when that door opens, I'm running for dear life. I don't know where I'm running to, but I'm going to get as close to that platform as I can. Remember, I'm sick. But Miss Kuhlman used to say, miracles happen when Jesus becomes more real to you than your sickness. It's true. And so I ran forward and got into the second row. And that, that presence increased and it seemed to like build inch by inch. You could just feel it intensify. And then a man came out named Steve Hill, not Brownsville Steve Hill, Pastor Steve Hill, mm -hmm. who was on staff. He also was smiling, which I couldn't figure out because I thought, why are these people so happy to be in church? My mom made me come to church. <laughs> why, why are they so excited about it? And, and he was beaming and he got up and prayed and then Bruce Hughes came out and played He Touched Me on the piano. And I've never seen anyone play piano like that. But more importantly, when he played, that feeling increased that I know now is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Right. Then the, the, the choir walked out and they walked out like in a single file line and they were all smiling. And you know, the air was different in there. It seemed to be more crisp. It was like heaven. And then they started singing. And then Jim Cernero came out and stood on his little box with the, he started directing. And I didn't know you were supposed to raise your hands. I, I didn't know what was right. I had no grid. I had no frame of reference. But when that first chorus started, my hands shot up. And I just started worshiping Jesus because it just seemed right. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't an ounce of religion in my heart. Sure. I didn't know what any of this was supposed to look like. And you're still sick at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was still sick. And my hands shot up. I didn't know the Lord. I just knew I loved what was going on. And my eyes were closed. And I remember looking behind me and there was a girl there whose skin was like oozing from the red sores on her Right. Arm. And during the worship, I started hearing these screeching sounds like, of these horrible sounds that I knew weren't people. And I asked my cousin, because Father Sam came with me, I said, what is that? And they go, he said, those are demons leaving people. And you could hear the demons leaving. And, and I looked back after the worship set and that girl's arm that was completely raw from a skin disease, had skin on it like a baby. What did that do to you? Oh, I just felt like the Jesus I heard about was actually in that room. Right. That he was there, that he had feelings, that I could talk to him. Right. So I closed my eyes and just kept worshiping. And then all of a sudden, I felt whatever I was feeling in that room, like triple. Mm. And, and instantly I said in my heart, Somebody who knows Jesus, just like that priest did, just walked into this room. And I opened my eyes and my father-in-law was on the platform. Right. And he started singing. He wasn't singing a song. He was singing straight to the Lord. That's right. That That's makes right. all the difference in the world. That's right. And then he said, Jesus is real. And if you want to know him and you want to give him your life, get down here. So I jumped over the, I mean, I tore down to the altar and I was praying and I received Jesus. And then he, he said, you little boy, come up here. And uh, I couldn't believe he was talking to me. And I went up there and I stood on that platform and felt like I walked into glory. And he just took a few steps towards me. And the next thing I felt was like this ocean of love go through my body. And now I know, I, and the next thing I know, I'm just gone. I'm on the floor. I didn't know how to describe it, but I loved it. He picked me, they, they picked me back up, probably someone as big as Kurt or somebody. They picked me back up and then he just waved his hand at me again and I went down again. And then I heard a voice. Now at this point, <clears throat> you didn't know, you didn't have the, the Christian 
uh, culture to know, oh, I'm supposed to go down. No. You're just, you just went out under the power. I just, I just have a vague memory of seeing a guy in an off-white <laughs> suit coming at me. Yeah. His hair parted straight to the side and yeah. a funny voice. Yeah. With my skin tone just right. coming and then I'm gone. Yeah. And then I heard his voice, uh, my father-in-law's voice, but it seemed like it was far away because that's how I was just totally right. under the power of God. It seemed like it was like in this tunnel and he said, this young boy will carry this anointing. He'll carry it to the nations of the world and he'll preach the gospel of the nations. Well, I didn't know what anointing was. I knew what a young boy was. I was yeah. one of them. I didn't know what the gospel was. I didn't know any of that. Sure. But it felt good. And then he picked me back. They picked me back up. He prayed for me again and I shook under the power of God until the janitor closed shop. I forgot about my sickness, Gene. I, I didn't even need anyone to say, oh, uh, test it out. I actually, my mom had to tell me, did you, do you, did you know you got healed that night? I said, oh, that's right. Yeah. I went home. I started reading my Bible. I read Good Morning, Holy Spirit. I started watching Christian television. And I started spending time with the Lord. Yeah. And I'd take my Bible. I grew up in a little Greek town called Tarpon Springs, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I just start telling, <laughs> it's not the best way, but I just start telling people they were going to hell. <laughs> I told my aunt that. I said, Auntie, you're going to hell. <laughs> yeah. Said, How did that go over? She said, if you, she, she said, why are you going to hell? Why am I going to hell? I said, you're a sinner. She goes, you call me a sinner again, I'm going to slap the lips off your face. <laughs> Somebody grabbed me because there's another way to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm true, bad. but there's another way. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that's how it all started. Yeah. And then years later, you end up marrying Pastor Benny's daughter, Jessica. Yeah, actually through ORU. I, yeah. I was recruited by ORU for a golf scholarship. Right. Instead, I went to the University of Florida. I backslid amazingly. The Lord touched my life so amazingly. And next thing you know, I'm not even, hadn't cracked my Bible in about right. a year and a half. I'm <clears throat> partying like crazy. And my brother actually went to ORU. He said before he left, he said, I believe that my obedience in light of your disobedience will actually bless our whole family. So he went and he met my wife's first cousin, Henry's daughter, Rachel. Yeah. And they're married now. And uh, they said, hey, you ought to meet my brother. He's in Gainesville, Florida. At the time I was, I was uh, injured, so I was coaching their golf team. And uh, I flew out there and I was nervous, Gene, because you know, I had the joy of spending the day with Brother Copeland yesterday. Right. And uh, when a father speaks into your life, you sense the weight of the responsibility. Because you, you know, Steve Hill from Brownsville told me something. He looked me in the eye and said, I can't change the gospel because one day I'll sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb mm -hmm. and have to explain to a martyr who has sawn in two why I changed the gospel he died for. Mm -hmm. So there's a weight that comes with this golden chain. Like all these backdrops are amazing. Yeah. But they're a healthy reminder that these men paid a price that we right. have to bring a harvest in for. So I was afraid to see my father-in-law. I flew out to California to see Jess and I was nervous. And the door opened. Jesse answered the door. I hadn't seen her since OCC. Yeah. It's been years. Wow. And uh, let's just say time had a way of making her a little more, a little different. Yeah. <laughs> she left that awkward stage. And she was beautiful. Right. And the Lord said, that's your wife. And I go, oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm not marrying into this. I want to play golf. Yeah. I'll give God the glory when I win a tournament, make a lot of money, and read my Bible once a day. The Lord said, this is your wife. Well, then Pastor Benny came behind her and my father-in-law said, I remember you, where have you been? Not where have you been physically, what are you doing with your life? Right. And it shot through me like a light went off. It, 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 it was like Adam when, when he heard from the Lord in the garden, but where have you been? So this is, what year is this? This is 2004. So we're talking 14 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, this is 03. Okay. Yeah. And so, so uh, I said, I, I've been around, sir, I guess. He said, it's good to see you. Because after I got healed and saved, he'd always call me into his office mm -hmm. and ask me to do my orthodox cross because it brought back memories of when he was an altar boy. Yeah. So that night he goes, are you going to marry my daughter? Wow. I go, uh, I don't know, sir. <laughs> no pressure. I, I go, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, well, do you want me to? I just started stuttering. I could. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, I mean, what would you like me to do? Yeah. You know? He said, are you taking her out on a date tonight? I said, I'd like to. 
He said, good, go have fun. So I took her out and I prayed a prayer that night. I said, Lord, no, the next day we pulled up to the house. I think it was the next day, right around that time. I said, if you've called me full time, when I walk in that house, I want Pastor Benny to offer me a full time job. Mm -hmm. So I walked in and he said, I have a, and before he could get it out, I said, I'll take it. He goes, you don't know what it is. I said, if it's cleaning toilets, I want it. He said, well, you don't even know if it's for any money. I said, I don't care. I want to walk with Jesus. I want him to mark my life. I don't want to live an average life. Right. I want to live that kind of life. You know, Gene? Yeah. I want God, I want my tombstone to have the thumbprint mm -hmm. of God on it. Yeah. And so he, he said, well, Jesse and I continued to date. And then he brought me back in. He said, if you're going to marry my daughter, I want you to be my assistant. And everyone around me started laughing. They go, you have no idea. That's you right. You did not have no idea. You can kiss sleep goodbye. Yeah, that's right. Jesse goes, no, Dad, anything but that position. He cannot be your assistant. He said, well, I got to know the guy. So I need him to move into the house and be my assistant. She goes, this is a death wish for you. Goes, You're not going to have a break. She was right. But it wasn't a death wish. It was an amazing experience. So I worked for no money. He said, I'll give you 90 days, no money. Jess goes, Dad, he has bills. He goes, that's the deal. I said, sir, if I do well after the 90 days, is there a future here? He said, no promises. I said, I'll take it. And I caught the wind. And that was it. That's when everything changed. I learned how to walk with the Lord, with intimacy, to love him, to steward his presence. How did that happen in those 90 days? Let's dive into oh. that a little bit. Tell me what you, you said you <laughs> learned to walk with the Lord. Mm. Uh, how, did, how did that happen? Well, first of all, when you live in the house, you get to watch someone behind the scenes. I knew right. don't go near his bedroom when he's with Jesus. Yeah. Don't go near it. Don't knock, don't text, don't call. Yeah. Don't do anything. So I learned how valuable time alone with Jesus was. Right. All alone, a couple hours a day. I did that. Um, I learned how to protect the anointing, hmm. to value it, to protect it. You know, like a lot of people from my generation, they, they have an issue with, for, you know, let's say, uh, order in a meeting or creating an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit can move. They would call that religion. A lot of it's not religion. A lot of, you know, when Jesus multiplied the food, he broke them up into 50s and 100s. He understood how to bring order so that miracles could flow. I learned that. But I learned above all, Gene, that it wasn't about the miracles. Right. It was about worshiping Jesus. Yeah. About the presence of the Holy That's Spirit. That's it. That he is never it. once That's taught me, like, uh, we just had a lady at Jesus 17, 58 years with polio. She left her braces on the ground, started sprinting, completely healed. Completely healed. I just got the healing testimonies in uh, late last night. There's too many to talk about. But he never gave me like, this is how you empty a wheelchair. This is how you open deaf ears. These are the steps. He said, make Jesus real by yielding to the Holy Spirit and worshiping and mm. he'll come in and do everything. And that's what I learned. Yeah, that's what I'm left with. And that's what I have a desire to give away to a, to a generation. You hit on something that we really, I've seen because I'm older than you, I've seen generations Yeah. You know, the charismatic renewal in the 60s and the 70s we in the Christian world, Protestant world, was much different. Mm -hmm. We almost lost the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit mm. because there was so much craziness with tongues. And, yeah. You know, people being out of order. Sure. So with the generation now and what you talked about is you learned how to how the Holy Spirit and operate in order. Well, let's go a little bit deeper in that in, the, in just the last few minutes here sure. in this program. Because I want people to understand it isn't, and you said it, it's not religion. It's understanding the flow of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think you have to create a wineskin. You know, the Lord told Moses in Exodus 25, create for me a habitation so that I can come and dwell there. And he said, build the, build, build the habitation that you saw while on the mountain. In other words, you can't build anything that God doesn't show you. You have to spend time with Jesus all alone yeah. and get the blueprint. The blueprint is the wineskin that the new wine flows through and in. Now, at the same time, we have to remember that the wineskin always serves the wine. Mm. So some people say, 
oh, well, I want order. Well, that's really an excuse for death, to be quite honest with you. It's an excuse for the fear of man. Because we shouldn't be, to be honest, so freaked out by the way people react by the power of God. Like John Arnott says, he's so right. We should be amazed that they survived their encounter with right. God. When we're talking about the Ancient of Days yeah. touching us, yeah. man, we should celebrate we made it through it. At the same time, for instance, God's opening church service, His opening service, His church launch was Pentecost. Yeah. So God thought that would be seeker friendly. Send the power of God. <laughs> yeah. And let, you know, the skeptics are going to be skeptics. I've learned that. It's true. Now, when it becomes disorderly, you'll know because it's taking glory from Jesus. It begins to point to a person. It begins to bring a distraction. It quenches the flow of the Spirit. And you can't teach that. You can't learn that in a class. You have to feel that. You have to sense that. And that only comes by being in the atmosphere. But I tell people all the time, pipes were made for water. Water was not made for pipes. These air-conditioned ducts would be useless if there's no air flowing. Right. So our first priority has to be this, at least I, corporately and even in our daily lives. What do you want, Lord? How do I get you to manifest here? And then I need your wisdom to teach me how to steward it. And that, that comes in many facets, one of which is, how do I give this away? I don't want to be the guy who's, if I'm the guy, it tells the next generation, it, it amazes them, but it doesn't invite them. Mm. Follow me? Yeah. It, it, it continues this model that it's only for the guy on the platform. Right. And it's not only for the guy on the platform. The guy on the platform should be an invitation into the more of God. So that's why Jesus is also son of man. Because he's son of man, it's also an invitation. He did it as God and man. And because he did it as man also, it says, I can do that too, even greater. Right. And that's what we have to give a generation. So stewarding the presence, you have to know what God wants, what he enjoys, that all in the scriptures, mm -hmm. what he loves, what he doesn't like, create a culture that invites him. And then once he comes, steward it, fan the flame, and give it away. I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, God sends the fire, but the priests keep it burning. Mm. That comes through wisdom and revelation. Keeping him requires the same stuff that brought him. In other words, what brought him is what keeps him. Hunger brings him, right. hunger keeps him. The minute hunger dries up, we are done. Mm. And in the kingdom, we're made hungry by eating. If there's anything, I told those kids at CFNI last night, if there's anything I want to leave you with, it's this. Get alone with Jesus. Before you, lose your ministry before you lose your secret place. Mm -hmm. Lose it all before you don't leave the secret place and God will give you everything you dreamed of. Right.